Following on in the Gospel of Luke, today we'll look at Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will put down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grains and goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. May God bless our hearing and understanding this reading from the Holy Word. Amen. Amen. Anybody who wants to come up? for the children's time. Sorry, y'all. No, 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 sorry, look at the tablet. It's a problem. What if you, what if you messed my sermon? Like, oh, sermon, I'd be completely lost. I have trouble. So, anyways, uh, so, like, let's play a game to talk about what I'm going to talk about. So, someone, I want you all to have a line, okay? Say, what do you want for dinner? Can you practice doing that? Say, what do you want for dinner? Okay, so when I point to you, say that line. Okay, let's practice. Okay, great. And, and all of you together. When I point to you as a group, just say it as a group, okay? So you're all playing that part. Great. And we're going to play out a little, little scene, okay? So I'm here. I'm looking at my tablet. I'm doing something. These, this game is so cool. Look what happens when the purple bird eats the green barrels. Oh, I know, I love this TV show. Oh, yeah, but look at this video of these tennis shoes blowing up. Now, why didn't I ever answer your question? Because I was distracted by my tablet, right? Was it frustrating? Yeah, a little frustrating, yeah. So, oh. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't trying to get you to commiserate with me when I can't get y'all's attention. And like I said, I do it too. I get distracted by things. I, when I was y'all's age, I would read books. I got in trouble for reading books in class in school because I was reading the wrong books. And I definitely was distracted by TV and stuff too. So it's universal, not just young people. Don't feel like I'm blaming y'all. But that's the thing, right? Being distracted. And in the story we heard in Scripture today, there's a guy who's really distracted by something. He comes up to Jesus, and Jesus is telling people in this big crowd all about God's love and how much God loves them and how they should treat other people. And this guy comes up and says, Hey, Jesus, tell my brother to give me money. 
And Jesus is like, what? It's the guy just comes out of nowhere. All he's thinking about, he's distracted by the family inheritance, the money he's supposed to get from their, their parents when their parents have passed away and there's, he and his brother are arguing about the money they get from, the, from their farm and from the different stuff that their family had. And they're arguing about who should get what. So this guy is so distracted, he's not even listening to what Jesus is actually talking about, which is love and caring for other people and how to be in connection with God. He wants Jesus to settle this argument for him. And it really is easy to happen, that we get so distracted, and it happens to us today too as Christians, that we can get so distracted by our tablets or by our you know, what we're worried about in our jobs or in school or in whether our friends, whether we have uh, certain friends or whether certain people like us or don't like us or whether we're popular enough on, you know, get enough hits on Instagram or YouTube or whatever thing we might be interested in. People get so distracted by all this different stuff and they forget to connect with God. And that's something we all do as human beings. So distraction can really be a problem, not just when you're trying to find out when someone, what somebody wants for dinner, but it can also be a problem when God's trying to get our attention and help us learn how to be the people God made us to be. Because if we pay attention to what God's telling us and what we learn from other people about God, we'll find out who we were really meant to be, Edie. I think that's right. I think that person wasn't really listening for God. God so that's the thing, Edie, is that God is always talking to us. If we, and that's like the song Miss Annie just sang, when we get on our knees, but even that means that's a metaphor, if we close our eyes and talk to God in prayer, anytime, even when it's loud, even when it's busy, whether we're worried or happy, if we listen, we can usually hear God speaking to us. And it's not like an audible voice, it's not like a microphone in our ear or something, or speaker in our ear, but it's something you hear in your heart. And it takes some attention, and it takes time to look and listen. Another good place is in church, hopefully, and also around other people we care about, but also when we, listen, we read the Bible, the, if we study the Bible and listen to what it has to say, those are all good places we can hear God if we're not distracted. But I think that's a really good point, Edie. That person wasn't really hearing God's voice is how I'd say that. So I think that God was speaking, but that guy was unable to hear. Well, thanks, guys, for listening. We're going to actually do, you know, we've been doing this, this little light of mine, so I want you all to sing a, stand up and sing that with me. We're actually going to do a different version because Dan and I have been sort of like, and other people have said, I'm not, there's apparently two versions of this little light of mine. Did you all realize that? We, they're close enough together we were confused, so we're doing a different version. I'm sorry. First thing we do is say the prayer. I am so sorry, y'all. I'm distracted. I'm distracted by the little light of mine. Let's pray this prayer together. Dear God, thank you for Jesus who shares the good news about you. Please help us to not be distracted so that we can learn more about you. Thank you and amen. And so Josiah, we usually, we all sing this little light of mine and we're trying to do it with y'all singing too so y'all can be part of it. But we're going to do a different version. So listen, and if you know this one, this is the one I know. So Dan's being nice to me. <laughs> This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. It sounds like that's what you're used to. That's the one. Yeah. Ah. Come on, sermon. And I want to apologize for a lot of folks. I know that I usually have the manuscripts of my sermon out. Um, apparently, they did not. I was distracted by things this morning. And so I started printing them late, and then they didn't all print. So I actually asked Dave, he, Dave Gow, to run and get them, and he was great to do that, but there were only two copies. So I'm so sorry for anyone who doesn't get my copy. Um, so, Carol, are you saying that you don't really necessarily need one or y'all can share or something? Okay. So, I'm going to give it to you. I know y'all really need it. Yeah. So 
I'm, I'm sorry about uh, that. I do apologize. I'm going to try to do better. So last week, we began the series on opening the door of abundance. We heard Jesus teach his disciples the Lord's Prayer, where he teaches us to ask for daily bread. Then we heard a series of stories uh, Jesus told to explain more about the purpose of prayer. Uh, and they, too, talked about bread and food. They also talked about God being the good parent who gives us what we need. And all this came around to Jesus turning the image of food and bread being what we need, to Jesus telling the disciples that what they truly need and what they get through prayer is connection to God through the Holy Spirit. So a couple of key things I said last week which will frame this whole series. I'll repeat them each of the weeks. One, Jesus shares an image of God. Jesus' primary image of God is as the good parent that gives us what we need. And two, stuff doesn't matter. All we need is the Spirit. And as I said last week, I'm not advocating for not trying to get people what they need in life. Jesus clearly never said to anyone, who cares about those in need? He emphasized answering the needs of the hungry, the sick, the outcast, and on and on. So what Jesus is teaching is a spiritual principle called abundance. And again, this week, we hear that word abundance. We first hear it in things do not, life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. And then in verse 16, he talks about the land of a rich man produced abundantly. And there's a reason this scripture comes shortly after the one we heard last week. This is a series of Jesus' teachings about wealth and property and things that sustain us. And each time, Jesus will twist it to help us understand how we, as his followers, his disciples, should approach material possessions. Today, I want to try to help us see what Jesus has to say about an abundant life. What does a true life of abundance look like? Well, Jesus clearly doesn't think it looks like a rich man who fills his barns with things. He doesn't hoard a harvest. We can tell that this story is a warning. It seems to be really straightforward, too. A rich man has a lot of stuff, and he doesn't share it, so God punishes him, right? That seems to be what the story's about. Well, Matt Skinner, who's a New Testament scholar, describes it as, quote, a parable that looks relatively easy to understand, which are the most dangerous ones. This parable deceives us at first. We think we can clearly tell what the problem is, and the setting of the story, what is happening when Jesus tells it, seems to amplify that understanding, because what happens well, Jesus is in a crowd again, right? And all through the Gospel of Luke, as we've looked at it this year, we've been seeing these crowds that gather around Jesus. And these crowds would have contained people from all walks of life. But the majority of the people were probably poor laborers, most likely because that's the vast majority of people in that time, the everyday workers. That's probably true of all times and places. But also... Because Jesus' message appealed to the poor, those on the bottom of society. In fact, he was one of them, an everyday worker. And yet we keep finding rich people and powerful people coming to hear Jesus and asking him questions. Each of the last several weeks, we've heard someone ask Jesus a question. A rich man, another rich man asks, who is my neighbor? Martha asks, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work? And the disciples last week in the scripture we heard ask, Lord, teach us to pray. And each time Jesus tells those people, those specific people, what they need to hear. And again this week, we need to look at who is asking the question and what Jesus is responding to. When we examine what Jesus is responding to, that will open up this dangerous parable that Dr. Skinner is talking about. We think this is a story about a rich man having too much stuff, and the person who approaches Jesus is asking about how he can get more stuff from his inheritance. So yeah, it's about greed, and it is. But the problem here 
is not the stuff. Remember what I said a second ago? What I emphasized last week? Stuff doesn't matter. And that also means that people with lots of stuff aren't necessarily spiritually deficient. Rich people can be deeply spiritual and have the right perspective about life. Rich people can and often do have an abundant life, the life that Jesus promises, without giving up all of their possessions. We often want Jesus to either justify having wealth, and there are lots of preachers who focus on that message, that stuff, that money equals God's favor. But that is not what Jesus says. Jesus says that stuff doesn't matter. Or we want Jesus to condemn the wealthy. Jesus was poor. Jesus served the poor. Jesus condemned those who were selfish with money. Therefore, being poor equals being holy. But Jesus says that stuff doesn't matter. So what is Jesus responding to then? What is the point of this dangerous parable? The point, it turns out, is a word and concept that is dangerous, one we need to really be careful with because it is really serious. It has been misused a lot, and some of us, including me, might be a little nervous when we hear it thrown around. And that concept is sin. Many, many of us have grown up with the concept of sin being used to bash us or bash other people. A lot of us left churches that misused the concept to berate and frankly harm people. Or like me, we saw that happening and didn't come to church until we finally heard the gospel preached in a healthy way. A lot of times we use the shorthand, fire and brimstone. A deluge of fire and brimstone. You can't really see it. The guy's really serious looking. It's good to laugh. It's good to laugh at stuff that is harmful. And let me be clear, I'm not saying churches of a certain theology are harmful and others are good. Same thing. There is harmful theology about sin in all sorts of places. But it's good to laugh. It's good to laugh at stuff that is harmful. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer of the 1500s, said, I often laugh at the devil. And the same concept has been promoted by other spiritual teachers in our tradition. The actual earliest version might come from Catherine of Siena, who lived a few hundred years before Martin Luther. But as a monk, Luther likely learned the same spiritual principles as Catherine, a devoted and revered nun, the stuff she taught her disciples, her fellow nuns, taught them including to laugh at the devil. And I do mean that those who throw around sin to harm people, who use sin in any form as like just a catch-all to blame people and make people feel bad or to claim their own opinion is right, even preachers, maybe especially preachers, when they do that, they are doing evil. They aren't evil. I'm not rejecting them as people. I'm not rejecting any of us as people for having harmful theology. But we all are used by evil, and that's personified by the devil in tradition, to twist and deform the truth. That actually is a good, healthy definition of sin as I understand it. It's a deformation of the truth or of the good. And religious people do it as much as anyone else. And we need to be careful. So a serious idea like sin deserves serious discussion. One old idea about sin in our Christian faith is summed up by a Latin phrase, incurvatus in se. I might have butchered that, I apologize. Which you can see means curved in on the self. The full phrase is homo incurvatus in se. So humans or humanity curved in on ourselves. This is an ancient definition of sin, although it isn't exhaustive. But it is a form of sin that covers a lot of areas. 
And if we look at it in contemporary understanding, it helps us see that sin often arises from the wounds and the pain we have in life. Evil works through our wounds to hurt us and hurt others. We get so focused on ourselves, our needs, our wants, our fears, that we don't see the bigger picture. So what we are trying to do in life is often misguided or harmful. But sometimes it is just the best that we can do in that moment, even if what we do is really, really bad. And that doesn't excuse it in principle, but it helps us have compassion on those who do harm, including having compassion on ourselves when we do wrong, even to ourselves. We don't say it's okay, but we say you are more than your sin. And isn't that the basis of the gospel? Remember that stuff doesn't matter. That includes the stuff that you have or haven't done. It doesn't, in an ultimate sense, matter. And that's tricky. It's a dangerous idea because we could misuse that too. I don't mean to say that everything can be excused or that all behavior is okay. What I mean is that sin is not who we are. What I do or fail to do does not define who I am in God's eyes. What defines me in God's eyes is God's grace, which is most clearly shown in Jesus. And so we come back to that crowd and the man who asks Jesus that question, Jesus, Tell my brother to give me my inheritance. But Jesus doesn't bite. And like I told the kids, part of that is that Jesus is probably shocked. The guy is coming out of nowhere. He clearly hasn't been listening to what Jesus is saying. I imagine Jesus saying, dude, read the room. He's not being a rabbi in the sense of a judge which was part of the job and is still part of the job of rabbis. Rabbis settle disputes like this, but Jesus isn't doing that here. The guy has come trying to get something out of Jesus, to use his authority and the respect people have for him to win what he thinks is rightfully his. He clearly doesn't care about what Jesus has been teaching. So Jesus tells a story that is meant to shock and surprise the man. It isn't a story that comes out of nowhere. The parables never do. Jesus speaks to the people in their context. He says what they need to hear. That's how he responded to all those different people with all the questions I listed earlier. Jesus sees through the people's concern and anxiety and points to their real trouble. And this rich man's trouble is that he is totally curved in on himself. Totally. He's come to meet Jesus, the Messiah. If we believe the traditional Christian teaching, this is God incarnate. And when I think of that, it's the truth walking around on two legs. It's God's love as a person. And what he wants Jesus to do is settle an argument about money. But it could be anything. As this image shows, it is often technology that distracts us and causes us to curve inward. But social media isn't inherently evil. TV isn't inherently evil. But they are, like money, potentially good stuff, useful stuff that can become a problem. Also, not unlike religion, a powerful, wonderful thing when it's healthy, terribly destructive when it is unhealthy. Jesus tells the man in the crowd this story, and it isn't meant to condemn the man. He isn't scoring points with the poor people in the crowd. That's not what Jesus does. Jesus isn't preaching hellfire and brimstone. Jesus is trying to teach, trying to reach this man He's trying to help him uncurve himself. So what does that mean? 
it looks like a person who is rich towards others. The problem of the rich man in this parable isn't his stuff. It's that he thinks his stuff will quell the restness, restlessness and worry in his soul. But it won't. Stuff doesn't quell our deepest longings. Stuff won't give us peace. Remember, stuff doesn't matter. In fact, the man storing up years' worth of grain and goods is going to cause other people in his community to starve. If the rich don't put their grain in the market, what does that do? It ex makes the price of grain skyrocket. We're seeing that happen in our world right now. He's going to wreck his local economy the way the war in Ukraine is wrecking the global economy today. Grain ships. I've been praying for this news. I've been celebrating it and watching it happen. That grain ships are maybe going to start leaving Ukraine soon. If they can stop shooting at each other long enough. But people face starvation because one person possibly, really a whole group. But we can, if we're thinking about this, Putin is curved in on himself. And world leaders. And even nations. And religious leaders are often curved in in harmful ways. But the alternative that Jesus suggests is a life of sharing. This painting shows the rich man and the alternative. It's by the artist Matt Jonknet. We see the man alone in a big house with lots of food and on the table and empty rooms around him. Lots of food on the table with lots of empty rooms around him. And death pointing at him. And in this other house next door, we see a family, yard full of toys. Dinner isn't a lot bigger than what the man has on his table. And they're holding hands. It means, but first of all, let me be clear, this doesn't mean that people who live alone, it doesn't mean single people are not blessed and loved by God. That's not what it's saying here. What it does mean is that a life of sharing is the purpose of our lives. Abundance doesn't come from having stuff. Abundance comes from how we share our lives. Remember last week I talked about our stuff being ourselves even? Our bodies, our lives, our relationships. That's also stuff. That's also part of what we share. And again, what we really need is the Spirit, because the Spirit is what connects us and gives us the power to give even when things are hard, even when there are challenges. And the Spirit helps us unbend ourselves, whatever our problems, and it helps us connect with other people and, most importantly, with God. And that is where we find our true life of abundance. Amen.